Um, just looking at the presentation overview, um, we're going to start today um, with the historical context and background of our uh, open access policy. Um, and then we'll look at um, the open access policy itself and in particular the drivers for open access um, and the communication and advocacy um, steps that we've undertaken. Uh, next we'll move on to the systems and processes that we've implemented and, um, and then we'll present the findings of our data. And finally, um, a little bit of research or feedback. Okay, so some background on the university itself. Um, it was um, first established in 1991 and was formed from a merger of the South Australian Institute of Technology and the Colleges of Advanced Education. Um, both institutions had their origins in the late um, 1800s um, and the university today is the um, South Australia's largest university and comprises of uh, 32,000 students um, across four city campuses um, as well as two regional campuses in Wyala and Mount Gambier. Um, the programs are designed with a view to forging professional connections and partnerships with industry and we offer a wide range of degree programs, including business, law, education, arts and social sciences, health sciences, information technology, engineering and the environment. Um, we have a strong research focus. In the last round of ERA, uh, which is Excellence in Research for Australia in 2015, 97% uh, of our research was deemed at world standard or above. And in 2015, uh, the university was ranked 25th in the world university rankings for universities under 50 years of age. Um, looking at the repository itself, it was established in 2006 and underwent various name changes until it was renamed the Research Outputs Repository in 2015. Um, each name change was also accompanied by repository software changes, so um, we've become quite uh, adept at migrations at this stage. Um, our first repository was named Arrow at UniSA, uh, which stood for the Australian Research Repositories Open to the World, and was formed out of federal government funding uh, to build Australia's institutional repository infrastructure. Um, the repository, repository was renamed in 2010 to the UniSA Research Archive, at which point the scope of the repository collection changed to not only include research outputs but also special archival collections. Um, and it changed once again in 2015 um, to refocus only on research outputs. Um, up until 2015, um, the publication reporting cycle um, was such that the research office um, uh, exported their metadata to the library um, basically at the end of the food chain. Um, so for the first few years populating the repository was the prime focus with a lower emphasis on making research outputs open access. Um, as you can see from the slide there are also two major events that occurred during the time span. Um, namely the university's open access policy in 2014 and the restructuring of the publication reporting process which allowed research outputs to be reported to the library first in 2015. Now, the Research Outputs Repository itself uh, contains a wide range of research outputs, including journal articles, book chapters, conference papers, uh, reviews, reports, patents, and so on, um, a few so uh, selected scholarly articles, um, as well as creative works, um, including paintings, sculptures, photos, digital works, and so on, um, as well as research degree theses. Um, there are currently approximately 62,000 records, um, including some metadata-only records. 
Um, we now have a strong focus on comprehensive collecting of research outputs and facilitating open access. We also have a strong focus on process improvement. So who or what were the drivers for open access at uh, the university? Uh, firstly, the former Deputy Director, Stephen Parnell, uh, was very passionate about facilitating and supporting open access and was tasked with drafting the open access policy. And under his leadership, the repository grew. The Vice-Chancellor also was very pro open access. This was exemplified in the Crossing the Horizon strategic plan of 2013 to 2018. Um, goal number two, and it stated, <coughs> excuse me, industry and end user informed research supporting an industry relevant curriculum. Of the four actions to achieve this outcome, one was on open access with the statement, uh, we will immediately adopt an open access research publication policy, making both our research outputs and our data sets available to potential collaborators through an open institutional repository. Other major drivers um, of open access, of course, have been the open access funder policies from the Australian Research Council and the National Health and Medical Research Council within Australia. Um, the NHMRC open access policy came into effect in July 2012. Um, as the Australian government makes major investment in research, the NHMRC wanted to ensure the widest possible dissemination of research supported by their grants. Their policy requires that all peer-reviewed journal articles published after July 2012 be made available in an open access institutional repository um, 12 months from the date of publication. Um, it did not uh, or does not include books, book chapters, theses and reports. Um, the version of the research output that are acceptable are the accepted manuscript and the final publisher version where possible, but they do not require grant recipients to opt for paid open access in order to meet the policy. Um, ARC's open access policy is comparable to NHMRC's and came into effect in January 2013 with the overarching aim to make publicly funded research available. Um, where they differ from the NHM, NHMRC, um, their policy includes all outputs. Now we'll just look at uh, the university's open access policy. Um, there are two key points um, in it. Uh, the first one being that an electronic copy of the final refereed revised draft, um, the accepted manuscript, um, of each research or scholarly output of the university uh, needs to be deposited in our repository uh, by the author within one month of acceptance of publication. Um, the other main point, um, open access to the full text will be available as soon as practicable and not later than 12 months after publication. Embargoes and access restrictions will be applied as necessary. So we needed to educate um, our academics and researchers in order to achieve all this as well. Um, so through our communication and advocacy efforts, um, we appointed a research connections librarian. Um, she's been quite crucial in um, advocating open access and with the core responsibilities to design, market and lead targeted services such as researcher IDs and um, open access compliance to support the, the research priorities of the university. In their role, they work closely with the repository staff and academic librarians uh, within the library and with researchers and other units in the university, such as the Business Intelligence and Planning Unit. Other mechanisms under, included, included articles on open access and publishing in the university's research degrees newsletter. Um, there have also been numerous workshops and training sessions for other library staff uh, research staff and HDR students. <coughs> uh, 
<clears throat> other mechanisms have been research guides. Um, the main guide that we've um, developed has been the open access guide, um, along with um, the collection of research, collection of research outputs guide. That's another one, and the publishing research guide. We've also developed some quick guides. Um, in relation to um, accepted manuscripts, open access and the repository, and um, submitting research outputs for open access. Okay. The university's copyright officer has also been enormously helpful in advocating open access. Um, their website contains information um, on um, open access and author rights and uh, they've also promoted open access at school board meetings. Uh, now I'll hand over to Kate. Thanks. So with the implementation of an open access policy, it meant that the university could no longer continue to have a spread out and disconnected publications collection process. And in fact, reducing red tape and duplication of effort within the university was another of the crossing the horizon objectives. As a result, publications output collection was consolidated within the library at the start of 2015. And in the same year, a joint project was initiated between the library, university IT, the research office and business intelligence and planning unit to create a solution to address this. We took a one team approach and were very much inspired by the awkward philosophy of enter once and reuse often. And the project developed a system where outputs were collected by the library and metadata flowed through to where it was needed. Via the institutional repositories discovery service, outputs and their metadata are exposed to the wider world, both directly through the interface or through harvest to IR at institutional repository aggregators. Metadata is also harvested into our internal reporting systems, where it's used to populate both internal reporting, such as staff activity reports, as well as external reporting requirements like ERA. Hang on. I've gone too far. Our new process included an online submission system with pre-population of metadata using a DOI lookup of Scopus or Web of Science with the aim to reduce the impact on researchers having to manually enter anything. The submission form also includes prompts for uploading accepted manuscripts and asks about open access. And you can see that circled down the bottom. We have a second page of the form that actually asks about grant and related data set information that often can only be captured from the researcher. Outside of direct submission by researchers, we also have a harvest process to identify missing UniSA authored outputs in Scopus and Web of Science so that they can be captured and added into our workflows. We migrated our repository system to our library management system in 2015 as well. While at the time it lacked a digital asset management functionality and we did have to come up with a workaround, we were offered a number of benefits. Most critically was the ability to easily get metadata out of the repository and into our university management reporting system. But other advantages were their extensive APIs that allowed records created from submission or harvest to be dropped into the system where staff could access and process using a better search interface, a metadata editor with robust data validation and editing tools. And we also had much better workflow management tools and reporting for metadata processing. Finally, Alma's APIs have 
been utilised by our web team and developers to create a suite of resources for the team that improve workflows, particularly generating handles and DOIs at the click of a button, and most significantly, automating the generation of emails requesting accepted manuscripts from researchers. An example of the screen is shown. For me, I think this is one of the most important process improvements that support our open access policy because it removes the tedium of creating and sending emails, which sounds like such a small thing, but this was a massive block in our workflows. So we have an open access policy and we have a new system and we have the workflow to implement it. So has it made a difference? Have our researchers started to change their culture? I'm going to start by saying that we, I don't think we can distinguish between the impact of our policy and that of our funders. But given that our policy is designed to support those policies, I don't think it really matters as long as it's having the impact of increasing our open content and allowing us to comply with those funder mandates. At UniSA, we've already mentioned that we've got 62,000 records, but for the next few slides, we're looking at a subset of our data that's only focusing on the records since published after 2007 and te predominantly textual materials of reports, journal articles, conference papers, chapters and books. Non-traditional outputs are very scatty as to whether or not we actually have content. Theses are mostly open access, so these throw out our numbers. The first chart is showing the distribution of our outputs within this subset, and you can see that the bulk of these are journal articles. It will be slightly distorted by the inclusion of 2017 publications, which being incomplete, journal articles are overrepresented, but you get a feel for what the collection looks like. This chart actually gives you a feel of what open access in this set looks like too given that each research output has been broken down by their access rights. The vast majority, particularly for books and chapters, is restricted, and this includes metadata-only records. But grey literature, like reports and conference papers, have a higher proportion of open access. Journal articles are gaining on them and have the highest proportion of embargoed content. And none of this is a surprise, I don't think, to anybody. Um, with journal articles gaining and being the most largest proportion of our collection, this is a significant portion of our open collection. So now let's look at how Australian funder policies have impacted on our collection. To do this, we've compared the proportion of open access when outputs have been funded by the ARC and NHMRC and compared this with the rest of our publications which I had trouble coming up with the term, so we'll just call them other. It's clear that funder mandates have resulted in a higher proportion of open access and embargoed content. With the NHMRC policy coming in first, these have the highest proportion of open access. And to simplify things here, I've just included both embargoed and open in the counts. While the ARC publications have less open content than the NHMRC, they still are significantly higher than our general publications. Looking at this data in a different way, this time breaking it down by publication year, there's a sense of when these mandates actually came into a, started to make a difference. And it starts almost immediately. Given that our NHMRC outputs start to increase their open proportion in 2012 when their policy came into effect. The ARC's policy doesn't start to make a difference until the same time as the UniSA's open policy, but you can see that the proportion of their open content is much higher than the other publications, showing the impact of this policy as well. This chart shows our collection as a whole, and it shows the open and embargo content in our repository by publication year as at the beginning of the month. It clearly shows a small increase in 2014 with greater increases in 2015 and 2016. But what is harder to determine from these numbers is whether this increase is due to our policies, the increased effort by the library on increasing open access as a response to these policies and our desires generally, or the general growth in the open access movement more widely. I suspect it's a combination of all three, 
but it, more research would be required to determine this. I also like this chart because it shows the proportion of embargoed content in our collection, and this is growing every month. This slide better demonstrates this, as it shows the proportion of embargoed content each month over the last 20 months. And you have to remember that with embargoed content, it changes each month, not only because you are adding to it as you add embargoed content, but as embargoes expire, they're also decreasing. So you've got wiggles. Um, when we started tracking these numbers, we had less than 100, about 70 or so, I think. But since then, as of last month, we've had a six times increase to well over 460. As most of our embargoed objects would be accepted manuscripts, this is an indication that our open access policy is coming into play. That didn't do what it was supposed to do. Oh. I actually think you missed a chart. Um, so this breakdown is also showing our accepted manuscripts showing their access and different conditions. Where our policy took effect is clear with the number of accepted manuscripts tripling between 2013 and 2014. Although the number of accepted manuscripts increased less dramatically for 2015 and 2016, they are still upward trending. So how does this compare with other versions of outputs that we collect in our repository? This first chart is basically showing what we've just been talking about. It's our, the count of accepted manuscripts by publication and it shows the overall increase in our collection over time. Our preprint collection, which is tiny, it's really tiny, it's less than 20, but it too is increasing and we're not actually actively collecting these. But far more interestingly, when you actually look at our open access published versions, we have a fairly flat line. We do have a slightly optimistic kick at the end where we've bumped over 500 outputs, but otherwise between 2008 and 2014, it's hovering very much between four and 500 outputs. So what do our researchers think? Clearly, if reading these quotes from our academics, and we haven't done far much as detailed, we need to do far more if we want to follow this. Open access is something that they're aware of, and they know that we have a policy, but it's more important to some than others. For them, the importance of open access is how much it can increase the dissemina dissemination of their research, help gain them readership, and improve their impact as well as meeting the needs of their stakeholders, such as funders. So to conclude, our open access policy has resulted in an increase in open access content in our repository, demonstrated by the rise in the number of accepted manuscripts and the overall higher proportion of open content in our repository. But determining the cause and effect is much harder to define. Funder mandates, I think, are a much stronger motivator for researchers than our own policy, but what our policy provides is a useful tool when encouraging researchers to comply with mandates. Our policy has also provided justification and motivation within the university to provide system and structural changes that have helped facilitate and grow our open collection. We're finding that accepted manuscripts, whilst not necessarily easy to extract out of our academics, are getting easier and this will then increase the open content in our repository. So we haven't seen a dramatic cultural change, but we are starting to see one. As researchers start to understand the importance of open access publishing, we can start to see the benefit to our repository with more accepted manuscripts and more open content. Thank you.